fire again, and he's not happy about it. Um, in fact, he wonders if he has any sympathy or compassion left in his soul. He's uh, disturbingly uh, gloomy. And um, the second character is Quentin Collins, who um, has a, a mysterious painting. Those of you who know the picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde, <laughs> one more rip-off of <laughs> Great classic Gothic novel, uh, but no one can touch Oscar Wilde as far as style. But anyhow, he uh, he has a painting that ages in his stead, and it it possesses all of the depravity of the life that he has lived, the drinking and the whoring and the all the diseases that he has come to. Whereas he continues to be gorgeous and young in real life and never changes. It also absorbs the werewolf curse so that he's not uh, attacked by the werewolf. He doesn't become a werewolf on the full moon. Painting is lost. And because he's growing hair between his fingers, he thinks the painting has been destroyed. Um, if David, who, uh, when the show came on the air, was how old would you say he was? Nine. Nine. Yeah. Now he's 16 and uh, fully uh, testosteroned <laughs> and in love with a girl who has just moved into the old house. The old house was burned down by Barnabas and it's been rebuilt by a woman named Antoinette, who is a hippie and smokes a lot of weed. <laughs> it's the 70s. And uh, she uh, is very much in love with Quentin. And he left the painting in her care, and she's, she's lost it. It's disappeared. So, and then the fifth character, this is just the prologue. The fifth character is Jacqueline, who is Antoinette's daughter, who is the reincarnation of Angelique. She's also 16. And she's the girl that David is in love with. She knows that she has powers. She knows that she can fly. And she paints. She's a painter. So this is just the prologue. And it, this is the, there's one paragraph for each character, and that's all I read, because there's so many people. And I guess if you want me to sign books, I mean, I'd love to answer questions forever. I have about 317 really funny stories. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, actresses love to be on stage. <laughs> okay, everybody can hear me? This is just a taste. The trees draw in their shadows. A violet stain seeps over the sky. And beneath the stone walls of a hundred-year-old mansion, the vampire stirs. Encased in a smothering blackness that smells faintly of blood, Barnabas can feel an unfamiliar surge of strength. But where he lies, there is no space, no air, only his foul breath and demon memories crawling beneath his eyelids like maggots. Panicked, he gasps to breathe, claws above his head. His fingernails rip his silken shroud and wooden splinters dig into the quick. Then in the midst of his struggling, a wave of sorrow washes over him, and he lies back in what he knows is a coffin. Once again, he has died forever. Had he been royalty in the Elizabethan age, an effigy would have been carved to adorn his tomb. He is that figure of veined and polished marble, hands fixed, face motionless, and buried within, a scarred and blackened soul. High in an upstairs bedroom in the great house, another anguished immortal paces the floor, restless and loose-limbed as a caged carnivore. Head pounding from too much brandy, Quentin lurches toward the mirror of his bureau and grimaces at his loathsome reflection. He lifts a furred hand to blot it out and a low growl rumbles in his chest. 
He is powerfully built, but the flood of urges that now consume him has sapped his potency. Whom will he kill? What innocent? He can sense a shift in his temperament, an exhaustion of tenderness, and flowing through his body, a hideous craving. Across the snowy vista that falls to the sea, his old tormentor rises out of the water, drawing the tide in his blood. What cleaver sliced this moon in half so perfectly, exposing the opalescence within? Just down the hall, in the third story tower room that looks out over the sea, a young man dreams of sailing over water. The sails swell, his boat heels, and his bow slips through the waves. David approaches an island where a young girl waits for him, her tangled hair lifted by the wind and her eyes the color of stars. She runs across the sand as he draws her nearer, her arms outstretched, and then she is folded against him. Again and again he draws her to him, only to have her dissolve in a mist. His body throbs with pulses so intense he wakes gasping for air. He hears her cry out before she disappears, turning to spray and salty foam and leaving only the scent of roses on his hands. Down the sea road stands a ghostly mansion. The moon is wrapped in a silver shroud. The milky columns shudder from the storm within. The windows rattle. A woman searches the rooms for a lost portrait, looking where she has looked before. High on the weed she smokes, Antoinette slams doors, overturns chests, drags clothes from, a, from armoires, blankets from shelves. She sobs and sinks to the floor, the world spinning. Where could it be? Impossible for it to be missing. Who could have taken it? She is afraid of Quentin. She thought she loved him, but now she knows how violent he can be. Why did she always make such bad choices in men? Jackie must have put the painting somewhere, in a storage room, under a bed, in the basement. As she breaks her face with her fingers, she can feel the synapses rip her brain. Meanwhile, in an adjoining bedroom, her daughter Jacqueline is painting by moonlight. Her concentration is such that she floats off her chair and hovers above her canvas, her brush lifting an image out of the shadows but it is not a painting of the boy who dreamed of her, or the portrait of Quentin her tortured mother must find. The brush moves by itself. Something is guiding her hand. Sparks fly out of the tip as it rolls on deep maroons and magentas. A vision emerges of a brooding man she does not recognize. Coal black hair combed into curving spikes across the forehead. Bloodshot eyes dark as chestnut seeds with a tiny flame in each iris. Craggy jaws and a large Romanesque nose and faintly glimmering just inside blood-tinged lips, two enlarged incisors. With a shock cry, Jackie throws down her brush and pulls back from the canvas. Something malevolent has risen out of her subconscious. She has painted the vampire. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Great.